ています。everyone, especially uh, the EWNC Academy, Dr. Samuel Morsi, Hassan, uh, and the team for the very kind invitation. I'm honored to join you tonight, especially join the panelists, uh, all of whom I know personally and I respect greatly. It is very hard to follow Professor Goel, uh, and we are moving from the cranial junction to uh, the Kodaikwina. And I will be, I have no disclosures. I will be covering uh, relatively briefly the diagnostic criteria, the relationship with litigation, uh, what is the incidence of the syndrome, correlation between clinical radiological issues, what does it mean to have a scan negative syndrome, and then share with you some work on long term outcomes, uh, physical but also mental health and hopefully finish with some summary. So we all know that Kodakwana syndrome is a clinical radiological diagnosis. It is not one based only on MRI and the clinical requirements are mainly those which I point in red, in other words, sphincter disturbance. So we need to have at least one or more of bladder and bowel, sorry, bladder and or bowel dysfunction, subtle anesthesia, sexual dysfunction with or without possible neurological deficit in the lower limbs. And that can be a unilateral sciatica, not necessarily bilateral sciatica. Um, so that's the clinical side, but at the same time, of course, we need radiological confirmation that there is dysfunction of the sacral and lumbar nerve roots in the vertebral canal. The point being that the compression should take place uh, within 24 uh, and in some cases, 48 hours to prevent permanent deficit. Now, this is a diagnosis with problems, and this is upfront. Um, there are very high litigation rates, specifically in the UK, which means there is immediately problem of defensive medicine. The actual incidence is unclear in that some papers say that it is 0.0004% in all patients with back pain, and only one to 2% of people with disc herniations that come to surgery. Um, and the, but at the same time, we have very high referral rates. So does that mean that we have a low threshold for referral? On the clinical side, there is no reliable clinical filter that identifies which patient with those symptoms is going to have a positive MRI. And therefore, there is a very high volume uh, in out of hours MRI referrals. And in our case in the UK, where we have centralized uh, tertiary neurosurgical centers, we are also unfortunately gatekeepers to the MRI provision. At the end of the day, for those who do have the syndrome, the symptoms are devastating uh, and they will have both a social and a psychological impact to the, to the patients who suffer from them. Now, I'm showing you here three of the most popular medical indemnity organizations or medical defense uh, organizations. And all of them have in their pages, this is for example, the MDU, one of probably the most dominant organization. They warn about the syndrome, the MDD US, uh, more dominant in Scotland, again, warning about this. And of course, the third player, third big player, the Medical Protection Society, warning against missing the syndrome. And the relationship between this syndrome and the medical legal world is an uncomfortable one. We have a very high litigation uh, rate in the UK. Over the last five, sorry, over a five year period, the NHS litigation authority, which is the authority that defends claims against the NHS for medical negligence has responded to over 80 Kodakwana claims. And the average compensation was over 200,000 pounds with the highest settlement being over 2 million. So you, it's no surprise that what I'm showing you here 
is an advertisement from a legal firm to go to them for a no win, no fee service. This has led to what I call the UK epidemic of Quina referrals or query Quina referrals, where our friends of ours and colleagues of ours are across Europe and beyond are always amazed at the volumes of referrals we get. Examples of this, this is a firm which claims that the average case they take on will settle 832,000 uh, pounds as opposed to the national average of 360. So it's encouraging people to sue uh, if they have been diagnosed with this syndrome. Now, there's definitely high costs. The, the MDU, which is the major indemnifier, in little over 10 years has identified nearly 150 claims for poor treatment of the syndrome. Of the cases settled, 12% received compensation payments of over half a million pounds. And then over the same period of approximately 10 years, it paid over four and a half million to cover the cost of the claimant's solicitors. So this money is not necessarily even going to the patients. Most of it is going to the solicitors. And to add insult to injury, this organization for the last four years has refused to provide cover for any neurosurgeon or spinal surgeon. So if we go back now and ask ourselves, what is the incidence of Kodakwana syndrome? And when we decided to answer this question, we struggled. We looked at data and there were difficulties in comparison between different studies because of heterogeneous definitions of the syndrome. There was lack of separation of uh, the advanced cases, advanced syndrome cases with retention with others with incomplete syndrome. Most papers have small sample sizes. Most of them are in a single center. Most of them, or a lot of them are from the UK and most of them are indeed retrospective. There's a high number of abstracts rather than full texts. And overall the quality is at best at level three. The evidence is level three, the quality is questionable. So we tried with a systematic review with colleagues to answer this question. And I don't want to bore you with the, with the epidemiological um, methodology, but we did come to two simple summaries that the incidence of Coraquana syndrome in secondary care and tertiary care is approximately 19%. And in, on the right, the incidence in those presenting with back pain to secondary care, on the other hand, is very, very small. So if you have back pain, the chance of having Kodakwana syndrome is not even half percent. But it, and therefore it does occur infrequently uh, in asymptomatic community populations. So the next question is how much does the clinical Kodakwana syndrome correlate with the radiological findings? And the reason behind this question is that we all get phone calls from radiologists who report a routinely requested scan. So a patient goes to their doctor, a routine MRI request is organized, and then that scan is done, let's say a couple of months later, but then suddenly you get an urgent call because they found radiological stenosis. So we've looked at 276 consecutive such uh, referrals over 18 months, and only 28% of them were positive, in scan positive, and the vast majority were negative. Only 3% had an alternative cause which was mimicking these symptoms. Interestingly, there was no single clinical feature differentiating between the above groups. In other words, they all had convincing symptoms. And this was a retrospective study in the Journal of Neurology. So the next question is, okay, since 70% of scans are negative, what happens to these patients who have the symptoms but, ne but have negative scans? And some, we don't have the answer to that, but some hints of an answer come from small series from neurology colleagues 
where they feel that there might be an, a, a suggestion of a functional disorder. So in their perspective series, these colleagues from urology found that 90% of those with a scan negative, with a negative scan had a positive Hoover sign and were prone to behaviors that are suggestive of a functional disorder. The actual radiological compromise was about a third. Whereas with those which were scan positive, and this is a very small series, the, these correlations were very different. So based on this small series, um, they went on to do a prospective one, a larger one. But before I show you that, let me clarify that functional disorders are psychogenic and non-organic disorders. The symptoms are considered to be real. In other words, they are not Munchausen's patients. They are not time wasters. Um, and it is perceived to be due to a problem with the functioning or the wiring, if you like, of the normal body process. The diagnosis is based upon positive features rather than negative features. And the spectrum of such diagnosis includes conditions like fibromyalgia, inflammatory bowel syndrome, and functional neurological disorder, all of which are in the ICD-10 classification of diseases. A good paper I think we have tried to produce is this one, which was a prospective study or looking at those that had a negative MRI despite convincing symptoms. And in this prospective series, we were able to see that patients with scan negative uh, Kodakwana syndrome had more positive clinical signs of a functional neurological disorder. So, so this supported further the impression of the smaller previous study. And this was statistically significant. Only 11% had uh, scan positive versus 68% in the scan negative. Now the same group of patients were more likely to describe their current back pain as their worst ever. And they used statistically significant different uh, words which were magnifying their pain, uh, not necessarily exaggerating it, but showing psychogenic input. And again, more susceptible to panic attack, 37 versus 70% all features pointing towards a functional neurological disorder, according to our expert colleagues who are world leaders in this uh, condition. But let's now shift away from the negative ones and go to those poor patients who do have an MRI proven Kodakwana syndrome. We all rush to operate, we all sometimes uh, fear the medical legal implications if we miss it. Uh, but the question is, how well do these patients do, even if we operate within 24 hours? So with this study, we tried to assess the long-term outcomes. So we designed a telephone-based uh, assessment of a consecutive cohort of, of identified patients. We chose 17 conservative patients. We went far back to allow long-term follow-up. And we use validated questionnaires to assess mental dysfunction, physical, uh, urinary, bowel, as well as sexual dysfunction. And we ask patients, for what symptom do you most value ongoing treatment after your surgery? And it was clearly pain. But it was a variety of things, including numbness, weakness, bladder, bowel, sexual dysfunction, very less than 10% had no problems. I mean, this is a key figure here. Less than 10% reported no problems, but most of them were comfortable enough to talk about pain, but uncomfortable to talk about socially embarrassing symptoms. We looked at what outpatient service they continue to use after treatment. And it was clearly physiotherapy as number one, we're well over 70%, but one in five was still going to urology outpatients for persisting symptoms. And then there was an array of multidisciplinary involvement for ongoing 
patient symptomatology. So the inclusion or, or the response rate rather was 60%, which is good for uh, this sort of study. The mean age was about 45 years. The average time since admission was 43 months. So it was, this was achieving decent long-term outcomes, which are not available much in the literature. Um, and we did find also that there was prevalence of mental health and other dysfunction. So with a mean follow-up time of 43 months, there was high prevalence of long-term disability. And if we look at these table for a second, the physical dysfunction long-term was 48%. The urinary dysfunction long-term, 76%. Bowel dysfunction long-term, 13%. And sexual dysfunction long-term was 39%. Those patients that presented with Kodak Wana syndrome with retention, in other words, a complete syndrome, they had significantly worse long-term outcomes with bladder, bowel, and sexual function compared to those who had an incomplete. And that makes sense because those with the incomplete, we can hopefully help more because less damage is done. Pain was the symptom they would value treatment mostly for. However, only 7% were able to get a post-operative pain management referral. So the service they need most is not the service they get most. And then we thought to address also long-term mental well-being, which is something that is difficult for a surgeon to ask because we don't get to see them at that length of period after the operation. But we tried to define mental health dysfunction with the MCS score less than the Scottish adult mean minus one standard deviation. This is the advice we got from statisticians and uh, neuropsychiatry. We use certain cutoffs as per this publication. And that was the one we chose because it was a study that involved 21,000 patients developing high sensitivity and specificity thresholds for depression criteria. And then we used this Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, aiming at investigating the relationship between the mental uh, component score and the physical symptoms. So if we look at this, effectively the answer we found is that 22% of our patients uh, as per the formula followed still had mental dysfunction. And you can see that in this graph, everyone to the right from here is this 22%. On top of that, we found that there were statistically significant correlations as expected between the bladder, the bowel, the sexual and the physical dysfunction and their effect on the mental health score. In other words, every single one of these physical problems and ongoing deficits independently was statistically relevant in the long-term mental health dysfunction. So with this data, we can see that the range of mental health related quality of life in this population of positive Kodak Wana syndrome patients, even though treated within 24 hours still has a high prevalence of uh, mental health susceptibility, therefore at risk of reception. And very few of these, less than a fifth, were actually known to the mental health services. And the correlations were indeed proven as per the physical dysfunction from the syndrome. What is the relevance? Well, we think this is novel objective data regarding long-term mental health outcomes and their influencing factors. And of course, the main aim is a hope that this will provide information to better identify those at risk on time 
and allow targeted mental health support for those in need. Shortly before closing, I'll share with you our pathway for suspected Kodakwana syndrome. So the first step is the referral. If a patient has reduced sensation in the saddle area with any of bladder or bowel or sexual dysfunction, uh, sciatica, whether it is unilateral or bilateral, that does not matter, with or without back pain, they get referred for an urgent MRI. If it's a positive scan, then there is an identifiable structural explanation and they will proceed to surgery ideally within 24 hours. If on the other hand, towards the right, there is no identifiable structural explanation on the MRI, they will continue to have scanning of the rest of the neuraxis to make sure there's nothing higher up. And if that's negative, they will be referred to the neurologists for investigations such as lumbar puncture. Very few cases uh, are picked up with demyelination, transverse myelitis, etc. They will then, if still negative, have MRI brain as an outpatient and neurophysiology. And then in the post discharge phase, there will be input from neurology, urology, uh, and of course, psychological support. Goes without saying that these people will have symptoms that require physiotherapy, analgesia, and pain clinic. Future directions. Well, we're very close to uh, analyzing the data of this prospective study. This is an example of a of a trainee-led study throughout the UK with participation from all training tertiary centers. The data has been uh, received, the study is closed, and analysis is the next step. And therefore, I would like to close with only a small number of conclusions. Almost 70% of patients with suspected Kodakwana syndrome have a normal or non-explanatory scan. Only 3% or so of the scan negative group in our series had an explanation for their symptoms. The long-term disability includes mental dysfunction, 21%, physical dysfunction, 48%, urinary dysfunction, 76%, bowel dysfunction, 13%, and sexual dysfunction, 39%. These are all socially uh, difficult to deal with. Patients with scan negative Kodakwana syndrome do have high rates of functional disorders and psychiatric comorbidity. I'd like to acknowledge all patients and staff in our hospital and all trainees and students who've helped and several colleagues that you can see there for their very hard uh, work. Thank you for listening. And I would like to hopefully see you all in Hamburg for the ENS Congress Corona permitting. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, can I ask, is there a role of vascular uh, malformation or uh, vascular injury to cause Kodakwina syndrome? or it's not in the causes? Good question. I am aware of only a very few case reports of, uh, for example, uh, venous engorgement, um, but they're very few and far between. We're talking less than a dozen or so. Um, but then again, it's not the, one of the big things that we think of. Yeah, but if people have cases like that, it would be nice to have, to put them together and, and share them with us. But we mm -hmm. have not had any in our series. All right. I can't see any other questions from the floor. So thank you very much, Andreas. Great.